The Psalter reading today comes from Psalms 139, verses 1 to 6 and 13 to 18. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Join me in a brief time of prayer. O oh, gracious and loving God, we come to you today again knowing that you hear us, that you are here in our midst, and that you love us more than we can comprehend. We thank you for always listening to us in all things, and giving us guidance, filling us with hope when it doesn't seem to be anywhere around us, and giving us the vision of your future for us in your church. We thank you that you're with us in our journey through this world every moment, ministering to us and supplying what we need to build your kingdom in that moment. And we pray today that as we reflect on your word together, that you would encourage us and strengthen us for the challenges that await us ahead this week. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned before, uh, from a worldwide pandemic and the health concerns it brings, to economic issues, to unrest throughout our nations, the, these are truly unprecedented times. Remember, we've talked many times before about how our Lord ministered during unprecedented times and when he was faced with the greatest challenges what he oftentimes did was to tell a story filled with meaning a story that spoke beyond words that could reach into our hearts and give us hope and that's what I'd like to do today. Our second reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. And this is, again, a story from Scripture that I believe speaks powerfully to us today. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. 
Satan. But he, Eli, said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and he lay down. Well, the Lord called again Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I didn't call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel didn't yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went, and he lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Well, Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Well, one Sunday morning during worship, a pastor was preaching a particularly long sermon. After an hour and a half of preaching, a large ceramic vase containing a potted plant fell off the altar and crashed to the ground, breaking into several pieces. Well, the congregation sat wide-eyed, not knowing what to do. When the pastor without missing a beat, said, Well, that's the first time I actually put a plant to sleep. <laughs> well, you know, life is full of unpleasant surprises for pastors who preach for hours and for everyone else. But some of those surprises are a lot worse than just sleeping plants. All of us are surprised from time to time with genuinely bad news. And many times the issue at hand is something that's outside of our control. Something that we couldn't have stopped from happening even if we wanted to. For instance, you know, we might have a devastating health issue and receive a diagnosis about it. You know, it just leaves us wondering what life will be like after that. We might receive a demotion at 
work or maybe the, the loss of a job. We might experience the loss of a mean, meaningful relationship or the loss of a loved one who passes away. Or we might receive bad news about something another person has done or is currently doing that is hurting somebody else. Maybe the bad news is something we're concerned with regarding some political issue uh, that happened or some social issue about which we're deeply concerned. A lot of bad news involves issues that we can't control, but it confronts us nonetheless. But even though we can't control it, one thing we can always control is how we choose to respond to bad news when we receive it. And there's a lot of stake in that decision because how we respond has consequences, good or bad. I don't want to, you know, stress all of you out or lay too much on you, but when we receive bad news, how we respond can make the difference between a bad or good outcome as the result of our response. But in our Old Testament reading today, the prophet Samuel illustrates an overall biblical principle that we're told time and again through scripture that we can follow that helps put us on the right path to the best outcome regardless of what bad news we've received you know some of the details of course depend upon the situation but when we receive bad news in addition to first coming to the Lord and seeking Him as we're doing this morning. The most important thing to do next is to include other people who have everyone's best interest in mind in our thinking process about what to do, about how to respond, and to do that as soon as possible. To include other people who have everyone's best interest in mind in our thinking process as soon as possible. You see, one big mistake too many folks make in life is trying to solve big problems on their own. It's easier than ever to do that these days with many folks still sheltering at home and, and uh, distanced from each other by six feet. You know, it's difficult uh, to, to converse with others. So it's easy to, to take on things by ourselves. And there are other reasons why we fall into this trap. You know, maybe we're embarrassed to share about our concern. Maybe we have an overconfidence in our abilities. Or maybe it's just old-fashioned stubbornness. But uh, at the root of it all is fear. Most of the time we don't share with well-meaning others about concern we have, about bad news that, that uh, we've just been made aware of because we're afraid of being vulnerable. What will they think about the bad news I bring up? How will they respond? Uh, you know, what if I don't like what they have to say? What if they think less of me? But regardless of our reason, flying solo, more often than not, leads to a big mess. God put all of us on this earth together for a reason, to take the journey through this broken world together. But there's another big mistake that too many make when they receive bad news. And that's to consult the wrong sources, the wrong people about how 
to respond. Now, how, how do we know that, that they're the wrong sources or the wrong people? It's because the interests that they have are too narrow. They're people who don't have everyone's best interest in mind with the conclusions that they come to and the ideas that they share. Now, doing so might feel better or easier for us in the moment, you know, to cling to this narrative over here that feels really good or to grab hold of this idea over there that feels really good. Or maybe even to consume this substance, uh, this, this drug that at this moment makes us feel really good and helps us forget about the concern that we have. But, mark my words, just like a dangerous addictive drug consulting the wrong people, all of those things, it might numb the pain temporarily, but it will ultimately also create more problems. God doesn't expect us to deal with bad news alone. And likewise, God doesn't want us to suffer the pain we'll inevitably experience by involving others in our thinking process who will lead us down dark paths. When it comes to responding to bad news, it's these two things that have the greatest potential to keep us from finding good solutions to problems. Keep us from knowing how to respond and make a difference about whatever we're concerned about. Involving others who have everyone's best interest in mind may not always be the easiest path, but it's the response overall that allows God to bring the greatest amount of healing into everyone's lives. Because regardless of what happens, regardless of what we're concerned about, at the end of the day, we all have to live on this earth together. And those who have everyone's best interest in mind in their thinking processes and, and the way that they go about things are those who will lead us on the right path. And as I mentioned, our passage from the book of 1 Samuel today, it speaks directly to this issue among others. Uh, now first of all, who is Samuel? Well remember, we, we've talked about Samuel before. He was an ancient Israelite leader. He ministered sometime around 1100 B.C. And that was at a particular time in Israel's history. It was in that transition from a period when its people were ruled by a series of local warlords called judges. And they were transitioning to a monarchy ruled by a single king whose offspring had hereditary privilege. Two different kinds of ways that people are ruled throughout the world. And in fact, Samuel was involved in appointing Israel's first two kings. And during this sensitive time of transition, Samuel ran around wearing many hats, you could say. He was a priest, a prophet, he was a war leader, and a judge. And he shepherded the Israelite people toward their future. He accomplished what many people might have thought was impossible. And he did it with God's help. And though, like most people in the Bible, Samuel was anything but perfect. His actions were anything but perfect in every instance. In fact, some of his actions really stunk. But many serve as a great example to us of what faithfulness looks like, including his actions in our story today. 
Uh, remember, we've talked about how the Bible, through the people that it includes in its stories, just as often teaches us what not to do as it does teach us what to do. And this is one of those passages where it teaches us what to do. Uh, we read about the, the first official position Samuel held in Israel, that of a servant to the priests in the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle was essentially a portable sanctuary. It was a big tent with a bunch of religious items in it. And the Israelites carried it around with them wherever they went before they had the chance to build a permanent temple in Jerusalem. So the tabernacle represented the presence of God among the people. It was the place where people gathered to worship and offer sacrifices, including animal sacrifices, to the Lord. This is the way at the time they expressed their faith. And we read in verse 1 that Samuel was ministering under the authority of a high priest in the tabernacle called Eli. But Eli was elderly, so he was in the process of shepherding his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, into his priestly role. And, you know, this would have been a great setup, right? You know, it would have been wonderful shepherding your two sons and to the role as, as high priest to, to follow you. It would have been great, be it not for the fact that Hophni and Phinehas were complete dingbats. And the scripture's really blunt about them. It, it refers to them in chapter 2, verse 12, as Belial in the Hebrew, which literally meant useless or good for nothing. So uh, no ambiguity there. And, and why? What, what did these guys do? Well, for one, Hophni and Phinehas would eat the meaty portions of the animal offerings that worshippers brought to the temple. Portions of the animals that were supposed to be burnt on the altar in honor of the Lord. And this in ancient Israelite society was like taking money out of the offering plate. I mean it was it was it was bad. And if this weren't bad enough these clowns were also having intimate relations with some of the female greeters who served at the tabernacle entrance, uh, the entrance of the tabernacle of the Lord. I mean, can you imagine stumbling upon that on your way into church? <laughs> Unbelievable. So Hophni and Phinehas, <coughs> they were a complete train wreck. So in chapter 2, God confronts their fa father Eli about this, telling him that, that Eli's grand plan for his sons to lead Israel was a non-starter. Uh, but instead, they would be replaced with another priest. The Lord says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. Well, in our passage today, God appears to Samuel to tell him that he is that promised priest who will replace Hophni and Phinehas. You know, we read in our passage, and you know, in verse 2 and 3, God wakes Samuel up in the middle of the night saying, you know, Samuel, Samuel, you know, which would have scared anybody half to death, and it scares Samuel half to death. He runs to Eli to find out if it's Eli who's calling him. But when he, he and Eli figure out that it's God calling out to Samuel, but Samuel goes back into his room to listen for God again. When God says, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house. For I have told him that I'm about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he didn't restrain them. Now, that Hebrew word translated as tingle there in verse 11. It's pronounced sill. Um, and you know, when we, when we hear the, the word, English word 
tingle, you know, we can think of it as like a good thing, you know, I've, you know, got tingly feelings, you know, because we're happy about something or, or the like. But the Hebrew word um, had a much different sense. It embodied the concepts of, of being confused, trembling, being submerged or sinking in water or quicksand. It was, so, so what God was saying is, is that he was going to use this, you, you know, this, 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 this ominous word is what he was doing to describe this devastating news he was delivering to Samuel about Eli and his family for the reasons that we discussed before. This was bad news that Samuel was receiving. And verse 15 tells us that because of this, well, he's afraid to share the news with Eli, which we can certainly understand. I mean, Eli was his boss, and he was, he was also Hophni and Phineas' father. I mean, imagine Eli at breakfast the next morning asking Samuel, you know, By the way, Samuel, what did God say to you last night? And Samuel responding, Oh, well, you know, uh, God said your family is doomed, Eli. Could you pass the pancakes, please? I mean, it's uh, not exactly a comfortable moment. Uh, the easier, more comfortable thing for Samuel to do when he received this bad news, quite frankly, was maybe to keep it to himself. You know, just not do anything with it. Or maybe share it with somebody else. Maybe who Samuel knew already didn't like Eli, Hophni, and Phineas. Somebody who was just itching to show Eli and his sons the underside of his boot if you know what I mean. There are all sorts of things Samuel could have done with this information. But as difficult and as awkward as it was, we read in verse 18 that Samuel does the most difficult thing possible. He tells Eli the bad news himself. Confronts him straight on. Because he knew that even though Eli certainly wasn't perfect, that Eli ultimately had everyone's best interest in mind. Samuel trusted that Eli, even though his sons were involved, even though, you know, uh, Eli, if he was a different kind of person, could have said, you know, oh, this, this young punk is trying to replace, you know, the, the job I have set aside for my kids. You know, all sorts of things could have happened. But because Eli was the person he was, Samuel shared his concerns with him. And how does Eli respond? Well, Eli says, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And this, you see, this allowed the elderly Eli time to come to peace about the situation. And, just as importantly, even more importantly probably, it allowed him time to continue to support and to nurture the, the ministry of this young Samuel, teaching Samuel valuable skills that he would need so that God could eventually work through sin to play that role of, of prophet, priest, uh, you know, war leader, uh, all those things that Samuel would have to do uh, and give the Israelite people hope, bring healing back into their nation again. Because Samuel chose to include the right person when he found out that bad news. It changed everything for Samuel and for the Israelite people overall. So while it's true that every situation is unique, uh, involving others who have that principle uh, that they hold fast, that, that everyone's best interest in mind is what's most important about anything. Involving them as soon as possible allows God 
to ultimately bring the greatest amount of healing into everyone's lives. In our day of sound bites and little, you know, YouTube snippets here and there, as I said, it's, it's easier than ever for us to grab onto this narrative, this idea, this thought, this tip, this whatever that, that purports to tell us what to do when faced with bad news. But even though more difficult and sometimes more awkward, it's cautiously prayerfully involving others who can see what's going on and have that vision of what's best for everybody. It's consulting them that will help us make the right decision. So our passage today encourages us to ask ourselves, how do I generally respond when I receive bad news? Do I keep it to myself? pretend like it doesn't exist? Or do I share it with people who end up causing more problems? Or do I share it with those who I know will ultimately work for everyone's good, regardless of how much effort or difficulty that requires? on my part. May God bless us during these difficult times. Amen.